ప్రెసిడెంట్ కె భాస్కర్ రెడ్డి గారు అండ్ అవర్ ఓపీ గోయత్ ఫ్రమ్ మేనేజింగ్ కమిటీ మెంబర్ ఎఫ్ఏపిసిసిఐ అండ్ అవర్ లెర్నర్ స్పీకర్స్ కామేష్ గారు అండ్ అవర్ అమిత్ కుమార్ ఫిత్కారీవాల్ ఫ్రమ్ ఇండైరెక్ట్ యాక్సెస్ ఎక్స్పర్ట్ అండ్ అవర్ చైర్మన్ డైరెక్ట్ యాక్సెస్ కమిటీ సిఏ రితేష్ మిట్టల్ అండ్ అవర్ కో చైర్మన్ రామ్దేవ్ బుటాడా గారు రామ్దేవ్ బుటాడా అండ్ చైర్మన్ జిఎస్ లెండ్ కస్టమ్స్ కమిటీ సిఏ సుధీర్ గారు అండ్ అవర్ కో చైర్ మొహమ్మద్ ఇర్షద్ అహ్మద్ అండ్ అదర్ డిస్టింగ్విష్ పార్టిసిపెంట్స్ అండ్ ఆల్ దీస్ థింగ్స్ ఐ వెల్కమ్ ఆల్ ఆఫ్ యూ టు దిస్ వెబినార్ అండ్ ఐ వెల్కమ్ అవర్ ప్రేమ్చంద్ కంకారియా ఎంసీ మెంబర్ ఎఫ్టీసీసీఐ ఆల్సో టు నో ది ఇంప్లికేషన్స్ ఆఫ్ ది ప్రపోజిడ్ బడ్జెట్ అమెండ్మెంట్స్ ఆన్ డైరెక్ట్ అండ్ ఇండైరెక్ట్ యాక్సెస్ బిఫోర్ స్టార్టింగ్ అవర్ ప్రొసీడింగ్స్ ఐ రిక్వెస్ట్ మిస్టర్ వెంకట్ టు షో అవర్ ఫ్యాప్సిస్ the largest business organization of telangana state with a legacy of excellence the voice of the industry representing the interests of 25000 businesses of all sizes sectors and regions empowering trade through advocacy solution and standard setting opening new avenues for unprecedented growth laying the foundation for an industrial transformation in the state of Telangana. Now, poised for the next century and beyond. The Federation of Telangana Chambers of Commerce and Industry, FTCCI. Together, let's rewrite the vision for a progressive future. before starting our proceedings i acknowledge the presence of our vice president mila jaydev garu ftcc now i request our president baskar reddy garu to give his welcome address thank you thank you lakshmi uh, good afternoon it gives me great pleasure to extend my welcome to all of you uh, this program uh, host budget analysis is being organized by uh, both uh, Federation of Telangana Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Federation of Andhra Pradesh Chamber of Commerce and Industry also joined us in uh, understanding this budget and uh, I extend my warm welcome to our uh, past president uh, and uh, FAPSI's think tank uh, Sri Goenkaji. Namaskar Goenkaji, welcome to you. Uh, Mr. Ritesh Mittal, uh, Chair Direct Access Committee. Uh, Mr. Kamalesh Susrala, partner BSR Affiliates Chennai, uh, CA Amit Kumar uh, Pitkariwal, Director Indirect Taxes, Delight Haskin Sales, LLP, Hyderabad, Chairman of the uh, Session, uh, Chartered Accountant, uh, Sri mm-hmm. Ramadev Guttadaji, Co-Chair, Direct Taxes Committee, Sri Chartered Accountant, Sudhir VS, Chair, GST uh, and Customs Committee, um, our uh, MC members and uh, Banking Committee Chairman, uh, Prem Kumarji and uh, our uh, co-chair uh, chartered accountant Mohamed uh, Virshadji um, and uh, various uh, invitees who have joined us today, uh, past president's members. Once again, I extend a very warm welcome to this post-budget analysis session. As you all know, the finance minister presented uh, the union budget on 1st February and we are gathered here to discuss and understand the implications of direct and indirect taxes. Uh, proposals with the uh, experts. I think I could see many of them um, are uh, chartered accountants and think tanks and uh, experts are there. Uh, overall, it looks the budget presented is growth oriented uh, with focus on four pillars, productivity, clim- um, climate action, financing and investment and PM Gati Shakti. These were the more main uh, four pillars it was mentioned by finance minister. The union budget 22-23 uh, uh, eased certain compliances for taxpayers also, even though there was no change uh, in income uh, tax labs, which was uh, much awaited. Uh, there was a slight dis- disappointment for a uh, uh, common tax, uh, tax player though. Uh, but the ease in compliance process and capping up surcharge to 15% on long-term capital gains uh, was a kind of a welcome measure. 
uh, if you observe the entire budget, a lot of impetus is given to digitalization uh, and uh, technology oriented and long term focused um, and a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, stress is given for capex. So on a supply side, lot of uh, lot of uh, measures have been given. But only thing is on demand side, uh, uh, I think I don't think uh, it has enough. Um, to please um, all the uh, industries and members. Uh, extension of period for setting up new manufacturing units for availing concessional tax is a welcome step again to boost local manufacturing and uh, contribution to make in India. With regard to indirect tax proposals, uh, the changes in the custom side, uh, most of the changes relate to phasing out duty exemptions on certain capital goods to support the domestic capital goods industry. In the process, the government would also garner some additional customs revenue. So I think by this time, uh, I think every detail must have come and all of uh, the experts must have gone analyzed it. And uh, we are uh, keen to listen to all of them and understand like what are all the uh, uh, implications of this budget. And our learned speakers will enlighten us uh, on the proposed amendments. Post that if uh, any uh, members have got any uh, uh, any doubts and all that, they can get it clarified. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I wish this uh, analysis a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now I welcome our uh, uh, past president and the uh, managing committee member of FUPCCIC, OP Goenka Garu, to give his uh, remarks on the union budget, post union budget. Um, Friends, it is my pleasure to be a part of this deliberation on the post on the post union budget 22-23 implication for trade and industry. I'm extremely grateful at the same time, thankful to the Pascal Regisab for involving FEPCI. As all of you are know very well about it, that I say it was very unfortunate. I always say that I would say along with the division of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, even the federation also got divided. But anyway, I always consider it to be always an unfortunate event. But having happened like that way, I am very happy that I'm saying involvement with both of them should be together. After all, Andhra is Andhra. Total, whether it is Telangana, whether it is this part of Andhra and all those things, we were working together, just like in Chandigarh and Haryana also, such thing has happened, but they work together even today also. I'm extremely happy, and I can assure also Bhaskar Disa, on behalf of the Federation, because our president could not attend today uh, this deliberation due to some unavoidable circumstances. So I would always say that. In future, once the FEPTI also gets stabilized, we are going to have a big programs and all those things. We will say that the involvement should be together for all the important events which are going to take place in the future. And that is what we need today. So that I'm saying, change of idea, what is happening, it can be conveyed and all. That's my remark, very little remark I would say is this budget. 22, 23, I would say it's remarkably focused on the macro growth and with micro all inclusive welfare, particularly the digital economy and, and the fintech technology enabling, uh, enabling development, etc. It is also aimed to create a unified, that's the more important thing is the logistic platform. And I was extremely happy that the development of the 100 new cargo terminals in the next three years, I feel it's a very significant, significant step in improving the supply chain ecosystem in the, our country. However, referring to direct and indirect access, I always find not much has been done. But anyway, we got the specialists, the super specialists who are going to convey their feelings about it and that will be very 
very useful for all of us to know, which we could not understand at, at outset itself. Coming to this, uh, uh, I would always believe that I'm say whether FT or uh, FTCCI should have a similar deliberation or discussion on the other important budget announcement, particularly MSME funding, logistic, and the infrastructure integration of the technology across the sector, blockchain, and virtual digital asset. I think they are also very main important with the key feature I could tell you of the budget and all this thing. I would not like to may take much of your time. Once again, I'm extremely grateful to the president of FTCCI for involving the FAPK and it has proved that we are all together. We are always, always together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now I welcome our uh, chairman, uh, Direct Access Committee, CA Ritesh Mittal, to give his introductory remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. In fact, uh, <clears throat> Obi Goenga ji, when we see FAPSI, FAPCCI, we associate ourselves more with FAPSI and less with FPCCI. Today also, many of the times it so happens, we identify as ourselves as FAPSI, and uh, later we understand, no, no, now it has changed to FPCCI. This is how, because that 15 years of print of FAPSI is there in the mind, sir. So it is not that the state is divided and FAPSI is no, sir. It is first, for in our minds also, it is FAPSI which comes first and FPCCI is later on. And somewhere in the mind, still we think it is the United Andhra in sir. And we are very happy that this time, uh, both the brothers have come together and uh, holding this program, FPCCI and FAPCCI. And uh, from our side, uh, it's, uh, we could not uh, see our uh, uh, Shudra from uh, FAPSI, okay? And uh, with respect to the union budget, and uh, it's uh, overall, I don't see much of changes with respect to income tax lapse, but yes, there is a good uh, boost has been tried to make in the areas of uh, infrastructure, agriculture, and health. And we have eminent speakers here who will be uh, taking it with respect to the subjects. We have Kami Sasurula, uh, from <coughs> BSR and uh, Mr. Amit Kumar from uh, Deloitte. Along with that, uh, we also thank uh, V.S. Sudhir. He is a chairman, but uh, he has also uh, taken up the session chairman because our criminalizer uh, help was on good. So thank you, Sudhir, for coming forward uh, for being the session chairman for the GST. And we also thank um, uh, Ramdev Bhutra, co-chairman, for uh, chairing the session for direct access. Thank you, Anana. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. Now I invite our co-chair Ramdev Bhutadagaru to introduce the speaker and give his observations and um, chair the technical session of direct tax proposals. Thank you, Nashi Madam. Good afternoon to my esteemed president, Sri Bhaskar Edigaru. And I am very much delighted to see after a long time our past president, Sri Goenkaji, I don't know whether he remembers us or not. Very well, very well. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, in RG also we worked together for some I time. Know. You see, mm. my, my memory is very, very strong. I can just say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> mm. So, you are very genius in putting the things straight forward mm -hmm. and taking along all the colleagues. That was very admirable and an uh, inspirational thing we have observed in you, sir. And we really, we are pleased to find you amongst us today. Now, I welcome from my side to our learned friends who are taking up technical sessions. Before I formally introduce Speaker Sri Kamesh on direct access, I would like to share a few thoughts on the budget from my side as madam has asked me to do it. Friends, uh, this budget exercise is done every year. Budget is nothing but estimation of figures for the coming year. Where the government is going to spend and from where the money is going to come. But we, in past several years, say three decades, we are seeing that 
whenever a budget is there, people see it only from taxation angle. What is the change in taxation? So it is, of course, part of the budget exercise only, but we have to keep it apart. First, we'll see what amount government is spending and where it is spending, whether it is going to boost economy and to sustain the economy, what measures government is taking up. So in this regard, I'll say the basic sutra of this budget 2022-23 is Atma Nirbhar Bharat. That was the main focus. Everywhere you see such huge capital expenditure which is going to be spent by the government in the coming year, they, they have laid their vision for another 25 years. So this budget was of course for 22-23, but they have laid vision in this budget for next 25 years. So it is really an absorbing thing for Indian economy to see that what sort of boost it would get. Particularly, PPP model, I think at least for three times our finance minister in the parliament has spoken on that. So that is a good thing, basically. Government is not supposed to indulge itself directly into any sort of business practice or any activity. Another thing which I found very important was regarding hospitality industry. Really, after this pandemic, that industry was really in doldrums. So, government has at least given some concern to see that this industry gets some boost. For MSME, this additional 2 lakh crores of emergency credit line, it is really going to help, I opine, and let us see how it works out. This digital university is something else which I don't know how it will work and what will be purpose of this university, let us see when it takes shape. Regarding this 400 Vande Bharat trains and 100 new cargo terminals, my view is that if India succeeds with timely completion of all these projects in coaches manufacturing and cargo terminals, it may come into big role in the global economy for export of these coaches. That will open the flood to gates for all the industrial entrepreneurs. This regarding infrastructure, every year we are seeing so many things. Another important thing in the budget which has uh, drawn my attention is linkages of rivers. It is really a very long-term vision. How much time it will take, I don't know. But thought is good. We have to go by it. And regarding farmers, etc., they are routine practices. Another thing regarding rollout of 5G services. When government itself is trusting much on technology, so this is already delayed. Better late than never. Let us see at least this year. This Regarding corporate side, one good proposal the finance minister has made, accelerated corporate exists. Earlier year, period, corporate exit was a very tedious task. We have to move to court, winding up process, all these things. Now, if it comes, it will help a lot in ease of doing business for persons to commence a company and if it doesn't work out, they can exit easily. So, I think with this brief on the budget, this uh, one thing I would like to add to this economy side, Estimated fiscal deficit is capped at 6.4% of GDP. It is really a good sign of part of the government that they are determined to fix it at lowest possible figure. Now coming to the direct tax proposals, friends. Of course, as our president has also said, we are not satisfied. When there is a buoyancy in recoveries and collections, in taxes, both on indirect, direct taxes front. Government should have considered at least some two, three things. As for my view, standard deduction would have been enhanced for salaried class. They are the genuine sufferers. I can say that. And another thing, rationalization of tax slabs for individuals HUF was very much needed because the present slab is there from 5 to 20 is totally irrational. Of course, another option they have given, but that is added with 
so many restrictions that you can't claim deduction is that but this slab should have been rationalized and one more thing what i was expecting is regarding removal of all those clauses which are in, resulting in double taxation for example section 50 capital c and 562 relating to transfer of immovable properties where difference between stamp duty value and registered value differs both buyer and seller are subjected to tax on the single transaction whether or not any of them has paid money or received money we don't know but on paper it seems it is a sort of injustice so such double taxation if it continues then the concept of taxing real income gets defeated so they would have thought on that of course we have expert uh, in kamesh to take up yesterday also i had a brief talk with him and i requested him to take up regarding so many changes they have brought in relating to charitable institution trust and hospitals etc lot of changes they have brought in which will go in long way and regarding this taxation of virtual digital asset the definition given in section 247 is really dangerous i don't know where it will take whether it will lead to so many more litigations i am not at all having any idea right now but the definition if you see it covers maximum things without any hesitation i can say and another thing which is very important from direct tax point of view which i would expect our friend kamesh to take it up this settling of issue for alliance of expenditure relating to exempt income of 14a through various courts has been brought in again which is really harmful i think whether or not income received or not earned or not which is exempt any expenditure incurred in that connection will not be allowed straight away whereas the so far uh, butada ji i think yes, uh, 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 we should uh, give a uh, mr yes, ramesh he will explain in detail i think yes sir yes sir just i am raising some highlight highlights sir okay okay i am just raising highlights for consideration okay okay but of course with kamesh will take it up in detail regarding this updation of returns there is a huge boost for the revenue in this throw government is always saying that we are trusting the taxpayers who can voluntarily comply but one thing comes to my mind that government is already in possession of huge data since they are unable to mine that data properly in time they have brought in this so that tax payers can voluntarily come because that uh, updation of returns which class 8a subsection 8a which has been introduced is really very lengthy one i think kamesh will take it up so with these brief things i welcome kamesh again and i for now information of all our friends we have joined today Kamesh is a graduate from Usman University, so I can say, अपना भाई है, यही पढ़ा लिखा है. He is a professional chartered accountant practicing with specialization in transfer pricing, mergers, and also dealing with multinational companies regularly. And also he has written so many tax articles which have been published in India. south east asia and european countries also he has worked for so many multinational companies with versatile experience and knowledge i welcome kamesh and i request him to take over from now on thank you sir thank you thank you ramdev butada garu thank you lakshmi garu thank you and the esteemed members of fabs your fccc as we call it now thank you one and all and a warm good afternoon to all of you um i will i have a presentation i'm going to run in quickly i'm probably going to take half an hour um the first 5 to 7 minutes i'm going to spend setting the context up on the run up to the budget how the budget looked like what are the global factors that sort of affected the environment around us and how does economic survey look like the next 20 minutes i'm going to spend on 
the direct tax proposals before I hand it over to Mr. Ram Devutadagaru. Um, firstly, let me put up the presentation that is in front of me. Can everybody see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, um, go back, ma'am, please. Go back, go back, go back. Yes. Oh, sorry. Go back, ma'am. Next slide. Yes, please stay here. Okay. So what's happened from this budget 2021? Um, we've had a second wave, uh, which actually brought down the economic growth. Last year, it was around 3.7%, which was a steep decline from the heady 6 or 7% growth that we saw the years before. Um, what has happened, the direct and indirect tax collections have picked up, as Mr. Ramdai Putaraji has told us. Uh, yesterday, she was on record saying that the indirect tax collections have been the highest since GST was instituted. Uh, that shows a steep economic recovery. Even the direct tax third quarter collections have more than um, tub doubled in terms of 60% increase as compared to the collections of last year. Now, something interesting is happening globally is that there's been an announcement by the US Federal Reserve that they're going to increase the interest rates thrice during 2022. What does it mean for us in India? It means that um, the inflows that are coming into the Indian stock market are going to reduce because of the inflationary pressures in the US and you're going to have some bit of cool down in the Indian stock markets because of funds actually taking flight from India. That's part one. Part two, it is also expected that the Indian Reserve Bank is also going to increase the interest rates in India, leading to lesser circulation of money in the market. So there are a lot of things that are on the anvil. We didn't expect US Fed Reserve to make that announcement, but since they've made it, we'll be forced to act. Now, economic contraction at 7.3% for 2021. Um, fact is that she's made an announcement that we'll be growing at 9%. This shows a great recovery as compared to the last year. Now, Omicron wave, we've spoken about it. Um, again, commodity prices and inflation. Like If you read the economic survey a little more closely, it actually warns about a global inflationary scenario coming up. That's because the commodity prices have sort of eaten up, heated up in the last nine months. The steel prices, the precious metal prices, all of them are at an all-time high. That's because of the fund flow that has happened into the markets that might stoke inflation. The WPP inflation yesterday was around 14% in India, which is quite high as compared to what it was in the last couple of years. So we are hoping that the government, while it did not do anything in the budget, is going to take measures to sort of control this inflation down. Can we go to the next slide, ma'am, please? Okay, um, we've spoken about the GDP. Um, that is part of the economic survey. They're talking about a 9% plus growth, which is great. Uh, we'll have to see how that sort of pans out in terms of the real growth that sort of comes in. Balance of payment surplus. Again, we are sitting on a huge balance of payment surplus as compared to the last year. Um, at least 80 billion is what is sitting right now yesterday in the economic survey. That's a number that was shown as the Indian foreign exchange reserves really healthy. We've spoken about direct tax revenues and indirect tax revenues being robust. I somewhere also agree with Mr. Butada's assertion that they could have done more on the direct tax front. But, you know, my personal belief is that uh, Indian traditional budgets have moved away from just tinkering with taxes. And they're probably looking at a long-term perspective with elections also coming up. I have a feeling that I'm happy that they've not done much in terms of what they could do populist. They have not take, done too many populist things and have stuck to the fiscal deficit. Um, the banking system, again, we've had a huge NPA issue. Um, the last few years, we're speaking about creating a bad bank. Uh, that's what Nishikant Desai was a record saying in the last five or six months. Uh, but huge capitalization has happened by the government to these banks. Um, NPA seem to be under control now. While that problem is controlled only because of... Um, the capitalization or there's a real control is something that we need to see as we see the banking numbers coming in next year. Again, um, Indian cap capital markets are at a high economic survey, flex, resurgence of global inflation. Again, we are poised for a large growth and uh, things seem to be going in the right direction with uh, third wave being moderate. Uh, India is poised for growth at 9%, probably 
going faster than most economies that uh, uh, India competes with. Can we move to the next slide, please? Right. So, what are the big policy announcements? What are the big five policy announcements in the budget? Accelerated corporate exits. exits. Right now, it takes two years for you to wind up a company. Um, they've said they will set up a center for exits, which essentially means they'll come back to the wall policy on corporate tax exits. One of the large concerns of foreign investors in India was they needed a moratorium on litigation, right? You would exit a company and there will be some litigation that will come up after five years. Um, the foreign investors want India to actually create a moratorium on litigation that can come up after you exit a business. That's something that she's going to look at. Maybe they're going to reduce that to six months from two years currently. Atmanirbar Bharat for defense procurement, again, she's capped it from 58% to 68% which is a great welcome move. Uh, again, with the 15% rate in manufacturing and a lot of focus on uh, domestic procurement and domestic manufacturing, I think manufacturing will move uh, forward. The SEZ Act, again, um, had a lot of loopholes. Right now, also, we are grappling with a lot of these provisions which do not have clarity, um, how the SEZ Act sort of syncs with the GST Act and the Income Tax Act in a lot of sections is not very clear. They are going to relook at this whole act. Um, yesterday, I, I was having a chat with uh, one of the commissioners of SCG and he said this is welcome. The reason being that right now you'll have to set up a unit in the DTA and SCZ separately. No foreign investor wants to actually set up two units at two different places just for the sake of a tax exemption. I think they're going to do some tweaking on that bit and make it much more user-friendly. Boost to private investment, she said. VC investments will get a boost. She's setting up a committee. To actually look at investments, India had had 44 billion FDI inflows last year. They see a potential for it to touch 100 billion quite quickly. So she has used the word private equity and venture capital at least 20 times yesterday in a speech. So I'm hoping um, that with digital, this also will take a boost. Again, digital rupee. Um, we've spoken about uh, all these cryptos and virtual digital currencies. We'll speak about it in a little more detail. Um, as we move along. Yes, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. So now we've spoken about it. The 15% rate was introduced a couple of years back. There was a condition which actually said you have to commence manufacturing by March 31st, 2023. They realized that with COVID, that was not possible. So it's now 2024 and not 23, which is welcome. Um, again, we had a startup policy that came into force three years back. And then there was an exemption that was provided for three years out of 10 years for eligible startups. Again, that condition was there until 22. Now we have extended that to 23. Long-term capital gains. Again, this is an interesting provision. We had long-term capital gains from securities, which had a surcharge of 15%, while all the other long-term capital gains were going at individual tax rate. The highest lap for individual tax rate was at 27%. To bring parity with all these long-term capital gains, that has now moved from 37% to 15%. So all the long-term capital gains currently will have a tax surcharge of 15%. I have a small slide which sort of talks about what is the benefit. But fact is that there's parity now in how the capital gains are taxed. Again, surcharge on taxation of AOPs, 37% to 15%. Uh, welcome move because we are expecting a huge infrastructure outlay in the next uh, one year. Um, when that happens, a lot of AOPs will come into force in India and having parity for taxation will really help. Next slide, please. Okay, dispute resolution, right? This is very interesting, the first point on my presentation. Now, there were multiple appeals that were filed by the tax department on issues where there were previous judgments of the High Court and Supreme Court. Now, on a similar issue where High Court has already opined in favor of the taxpayer, the tax authority will file an appeal. Now, this provision will curb these unnecessary appeals that are being filed by the tax department. Now, the provision says the tax department will file an application saying to the ITAT or the High Court saying that we will postpone filing an appeal until the issue that is currently with you is decided. So, basically, the tax department will not file an appeal if there is an already pending issue on the same matter with another high court or the tribunal. Uh, faceless assessment scheme, again, um, this has caused a lot of pain to 
small medium tax payers in the last few years we have had technology issues we have had issues with submissions we have had issues on how assessments went on uh, there have been a lot of cases filed with courts requesting for faceless assessments to be made null and void um, but i think this process is evolving faceless assessments by itself was a welcome move um, now what the finance minister proposes right now through her proposals is that she says that there was a provision which said if procedure is not followed the assessment is void of an issue she said that that provision is removed right now and they will correct the anomalies in the faceless assessments as it happens um now only the regular assessment was in the faceless regime and the transfer pricing was not now that will also come under the faceless tax regime from 2024 um again last one is interesting lot of times the tax payers after a couple of years realize omissions in their tax returns i let's say i file a tax return for this year in february or march and i realize in two years that i have omitted paying tax on a certain income now the time limit for filing a revised return has gone down now what does a tax payer do now what she has proposed is that if you realize there is an omission of your income after you file the tax return you have the option to file a tax return till 2 years from the end of the relevant assessment year if you file it within 1 year from the end of the relevant assessment year you will end up paying 25% extra of the tax and interest that would have been paid and if you end up doing it after 2 years you'll end up paying 50% now there's a catch here the catch here she says that this should not be a subject matter of assessment or reassessment now that is surprising because the time limit for issuing a scrutiny notice is only 3 year 3 months from the end of the relevant assessment year now how can a subject matter which will be revised not be a subject matter of assessment or reassessment we need to see how these rules sort of play up in actuality but the fact is that this is a welcome provision please can we move to the next slide please yes tds at the rate of 10% to apply to any benefit or perquisite um now the lot of professionals employed by businesses not as employees but they gift get gifts they get some non monetary perquisites they were not taxed before she wants to institute a mechanism whereby these are taxed and tds is deducted for example the perks that doctors get from pharma companies i know it because my wife is a doctor um so these perks how do they get taxed is something that is going to get discussed these are called non monetary perquisites and these are what is going to be taxed at 10% now dividend from foreign companies this is interesting before if i was receiving a foreign dividend i was provided a concessional tax rate of 15% but last year we changed our dividend tax regime from dividend distribution tax to taxation in the hands of the shareholder now these dividends are now taxed in the hands of the shareholder at the rate applicable for the shareholder she has said that from next year they going to do away with the 15% and even the foreign dividends will be taxed like domestic dividends which means if you receive a foreign dividend it will get taxed at your bracket at your tax bracket now disallowance under 37 this is again an offense prohibited by law there are a lot of rulings and judgments last few years which said that any expense that are paid which is not prohibited can i claim a deduction but this now sort of flex the rule full the last one is again procedural but important um they're talking about you not filing a tds return if you do not file a tds return the rate of tds applicable to you will be twice of what is in the section it was only applicable for tds now they have not they have now made it applicable for a tcs provision also which means if you do not file a tcs return you will now have to deduct at double the rate next slide please okay mr butada ji spoke about disallowance under section 49 this is a draconian provision litigation has now dragged on in courts for a long long time one of the elements of the controversy or litigation was what if i do not have exempt income in a particular year but i have expenditure which i spend in relation to that exempt exempt income what happens to that now there was a provision 
the taxpayers were taking advantage of judgments by various courts which said that if you do not have exemption exempt income in a particular year no expenditure disallowance under 14a shall be applicable but now this clarifies to say 14a is automatic which means if i do not have an income in a particular year which is exempt but if you have an expenditure that expenditure will still be disallowed under the provisions of section 14a now let's understand reassessment provisions right i mean which is important there are lots on this slide i don't want to read up everything on the slide but the fact is that these reassessment provisions are important um now there was a huge discussion on timing of issue of notice under section 148 when can the notice be issued what is the timing of issue there was an amendment last year which clarified basically on when you can issue that notice now we were expecting some clarification because there were a lot of issues the tax department had raised last year on the assessments but the clarification has not come can you move to the next slide please okay this is pertaining to ifsc ifsc is nothing but the gift city that was set up in gujarat now only foreign financial institutions could work from gift city before now they have extended the benefits of gift city to equipment leasing companies which is somebody can actually lease a ship from the gift city they have said foreign universities can be set up in gift city and they can still get the tax benefit so this is basically extending the benefits of an ifsc to a lot of businesses which derive foreign exchange can we move to the next slide please okay now let's look at the amd space um three three major issues in the current amd space that india is grappling with right um there has been a spate of ipos that have happened in the last two years and a lot of retail investors have invested in these ipos a lot of unicorns that we know have gone for an ipo um an option before an indian unicorn is either go to an indian listing or foreign listing but currently india can only list indian company can only list their adrs and gdrs abroad there was an expectation that the finance minister will bring some provisions which will enable indian companies to list abroad but unfortunately that has not come that is one gap that needs to be filled or some clarification needs to come now let's look at inbound and outbound mergers what happens when a foreign company merges into an indian company when a foreign company merges into an indian company there is an exemption that is provided in the indian indian income tax act because the resulting company is an indian company but in an outbound merger scenario no such clarification is provided that's the reason we were expecting some clarification on how outbound mergers will work from an india perspective but that's also not come now coming to spacs what are spacs spacs were special purpose acquisition companies which are now the buzz all across the world basically this is the companies that is set up which is a shell company which goes for an ipo and then it acquires companies and merges its within itself now buzzfeed was one of the companies that went for a spac listing a lot of indian companies are looking at spac listing very seriously in the next one year um but there are no enabling provisions in the indian tax law Uh, we were expecting something to come there that has also not happened now goodwill right most important part is goodwill um last year they amended the income tax act to provide that goodwill acquired or accounting shall not be a depreciable asset now after the amendment has come they have not made a change to the definition of actual cost under section 43 now they have made a definition change to the actual cost the condition or the amendment remains the same goodwill in the books is no longer a depreciable asset whether acquired or accounting can we move to the next slide please okay next slide right no change in exemption limit mr ramdev butada ji speak about it um, maybe it could have been tweaked a little bit i was expecting for a housing loan exemption increase in 2 lakhs limit to let's say 5 lakhs or 7 lakhs that's not happened atc could have been increased to a couple of lakhs considering it was a covid year that's not happened um i mean standard deduction again they could have increased it that also has not happened um but the view has been i mean we thought the finance secretary also speak before the budget that the view has been that they want everybody to move away from these exemptions um 
they have introduced the 15% tax rate they have rationalized the tax rates for corporates they want them to do away with all the exemptions that are applicable and move to the new tax regime the same way they have actually put up a new tax regime for personal taxes also they do not want people to take exemptions now they want to do away with all of this and they want to rationalize the tax rates they are already rationalized but they want to bulk up people to move to those rates so i do not see any exemptions happening in the next few years and we are going to move to more and more flat tax rates as we move forward right again small little tweaks in at dd um, and nps uh, taxing non payments covid related payments again this has been a want of industry deduction for expenses amounts received by employees for covid debts uh, they have now been exempt now again surcharge i have shown the rates below because of reduction of surcharge for incomes about 2 to 5 crore the rate of effective tax rate reduction is 2.08% above 5 crores there is a benefit of 5% can we move to the next slide please okay most interesting uh, most important right uh, this has been taken up in two ways um, virtual digital asset um, one lot of happiness has been felt with a lot of people who actually trade in currency digital currency especially because there was a feeling that india might ban it but legitimizing and taxing digital currency would actually mean that india will come back with a complex set of regulations on how to regulate digital currency so there are two views one there is a feeling that 30% tax that they have introduced in the budget yesterday was quite high but the other feeling is that it has been legitimate and india and rbi is currently working on a set of regulations to tax cryptocurrency now but how was the stock market or the digital currency um reacted to this they have gone up yesterday it doesn't matter if you tax it at 30% um you know bitcoin and ethereum have gone up yesterday uh, i don't think the reaction is much it is muted um i i believe that the definition of virtual digital currency is much more than just a bitcoin or an ethereum uh, it is much more it is probably a means to tax nft also um there's something called a web 3 that is sort of coming up which will become a rage in the next 6 months so with this complex large definition of virtual digital currency they want to tax all kinds of currencies which are created through a virtual medium or there is a blockchain involved um anything that is not regulated by the government will now come come under this is what is my sense they also want to institute a digital currency that is rupee will go digital i don't know how that will happen because a lot of times the way we use google pay and paytm is all digital how will there be a difference between that digital currency and how all of this operates is something that you should wait and see but what is a pain point here is that while my gain from digital currency will be taxed at 30% i will not get a deduction for the loss which is a pain for me uh, which means it is treated like a speculative business like say a horse racing is taxed in india you tax the gain but you do not give a deduction for the loss that's how this is going to be taxed uh this 15% rate that they have introduced they have not made it clear that it is applicable for the virtual digital currency my feeling is that it will still be taxed at 37% uh so the effective rates will be much higher than 30% it might go up to 36 37% um again risk of double taxation the section 562 will apply which means that if you transfer a digital currency to a relative let's say you are gifting it to a child or if you are transferring it to a relative and let them less than consideration uh, it will get taxed in your hands uh, again when he sells it is going to get taxed again so there will be a double taxation incidence they have not clarified how that will work but i am expecting that they'll sort it out again tds at 1% on transfer of vda to a resident which means whenever transfers happen the transferer will be under liability to deduct 1% um again exchange there might be a lot of issues that will crop up but clarifications will come the government is still grappling with how to handle this to be honest um so as we look forward i think uh, taxation is a welcome move uh, rate may be slightly steep 
but i believe it is still a welcome move that there is clarity here can we move to the next slide please okay so this is bonus stripping essentially the bonus stripping positions which provisions which were there for shares are now applicable for reits aifs and securities also which essentially means that if i buy original security before 3 months and then sell it or original securities sold after 9 months the bonus stripping provisions will not apply very clearly i cannot buy a security before the bonus date and then sell and book a loss because after you issue a bonus the price of that share will come down there are limits that have been prescribed under the act under this provision this provision is already existing in the income tax act for shares this has now been extended to all the securities can we move to the next slide please thank you thank you so much uh, wonderful talking to you i'll be on standby after the indirect tax presentation for you to ask me any questions that you might have and coming to charitable institutions that mr ramdev utada ji spoke about um you know there are two sections under the income tax act one section 1023c and section 11 and 12 now both of these provisions uh, work simultaneously but they did not have any control now they say that they have to account their books if they have income above the taxable limit before the claiming of the exemption they also have put a requirement that they have to follow certain conditions for them to be able to get the exemption they have also extended the registration requirements so it is procedural but if there are charitable institutions they need definitely look to look into thank you thank you so much thank you very much sir shall we take questions now itself or afterwards i i think we are we are, we are running off schedule um am i right mr lakshmi ji Yeah, you can take the questions also, no? In the chat box. Ah, uh, ah, uh, Kamesh, I think we have sufficient time. We are four thirty now. The oh, session sure. uh, is scheduled to go up to six, so I am sure Amit uh, uh, may not require a huge time. Ah, uh, so it would be better if a few participants have some question they can clarify then and there. So yeah. if the participation ca participants can put your questions in Q and A box, ah, uh, five minutes we can take the question. Uh, then we can start indirect tax proposal. After that, we can again take uh, questions jointly. If Kamish uh, would be saying with us, sure, Sudhir Garu, um, no problem. I'll try my best as we get questions. But the fact is that um, broadly, I do not think the Income Tax Act will be tweaked too much as we go along. These provisions are here to stay. Our uh, budgets are right now being used for the last four or five years to actually tweak. economic policy and provide a direction for the government to move forward i mean those days of actually moving rates and changing provisions is not going to have happen going forward and that's my honest belief and tax professionals like us will have less and less work to do as the budgets get announced and amit that will probably agree with us <laughs> yes definitely uh i think there are no questions coming up in the q and a So I think we can proceed with the indirect tax uh, proposal. Sure. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just uh, put up my presentation. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Amit, uh, uh, a formal introduction of yours, uh, uh, I will do. Uh, then you can uh, and give you a small background uh, for the discussion today, and then uh, you can start up. Sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I have. Uh, one of the eminent uh, uh, tax personality today with us today uh, uh, to share the changes which is happening as uh, proposed to happen as far as the indirect tax is concerned so he is mr amit kumar uh, uh, fitkariwal uh, he is a director in deloitte india uh, deloitte indirect tax practice and he is based in hyderabad office with more than 15 years of post qualification experience is a chartered accountant a uh, post graduate in commerce uh, from kolkata university and graduate in law from osmania university hyderabad uh, amit has uh, assisted uh, several companies in india in service sector manufacturing pharma engineering aerospace public sector as well as handled indirect tax issues efficiently by providing timely advice 
and compliance services in addition to helping them in implementation of gst in india right from 1st of july 2017 he has also served several foreign companies having presence in india in structuring epc contracts handling advisory compliance and indirect tax litigation matters for many co uh, companies across several industries such as infra it and services he deals with clients uh, uh, across a broad range of sectors including manufacturing uh, it infra and has considerable experience in dealing with indirect tax issues he has experience in assisting various uh, assisting several uh, multinational entities in their uh, indirect tax planning and structuring from the inception uh, phase in india so that's a small brief uh, about uh, amit to you uh, amit uh, i would just want to uh, you to uh, i'm sure you are going to cover the entire proposed changes as far as the finance bill is concerned uh, i also want you to touch upon those sort of uh, uh, provisions which uh, actually are in effect now but it is being bought as a proposal now so what is going to happen uh, to the fate which already we have complied with a certain provision assuming the law had a powers for it uh, if you could also uh, stress upon that and uh, uh, clear the confusion to the participants because when you are explaining a particular provision people may think this is already in existence what is this new so you can give a clarification and background so that the participants don't get confused uh, so with this uh, the floor is yours yeah thank you uh, so much sudhir uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you uh, to uh, the president uh, and all the uh, honorable members to inviting me to share my uh, views on the uh, indirect tax implications in the budget uh, so so without much ado i'll uh, jump in <laughs> to the proposals and as uh, the earlier speakers uh, have said that the budget uh, the budget nowadays it is all to implement the government policy Uh, and this year budget also is not different it is uh, if you have could have seen the theme of the budget uh, specifically from the customs perspective it is again on the uh, making india atmanirbhar bharat so so to take the vision of our honorable pm forward uh, uh, we have seen that there are several changes specifically in the customs duty uh, once i say that uh, uh, customs duty have been made Uh, there are various sectors like capital, specifically capex sector, where the customs duty have been increased uh, to uh, to strengthen the domestic capex industry. At the same time, there is phased manufacturing uh, program also, where again uh, customs duty benefits have been given and it has been graded so that those duties uh, in coming year again would be enhanced uh, by the time the domestic industry is up and running. Uh, similarly from gst perspective uh, of course uh, uh, the changes as all of us we are aware that from gst perspective the changes have to be confirmed or recommended by the gst council and budget is basically to implement those changes and as uh, sudhir was uh, he was mentioning that there are few changes which we will see it is already implemented like say for example gst are uh, input credit based on 2b so it is already implemented from january onwards but uh, but so we will see so why there was a change in the provisions to basically give the uh, legal backing so so there are several changes specifically in gst which government has already implemented by making enhancement in the gst and portal but always there were uh, issues uh, surrounding on the legal ba backing of the same so so government has proposed several such changes to provide the legal backing so as to avoid any dispute from the taxpayers uh, that there are no uh, legal provisions uh, uh to implement those changes so so gst uh, and then already my friend kamesh he has spoken about the scz so yes we have to await for the uh, the revamped scz law as the government has said uh, uh, and of course it is a good uh, direction and we are hoping that uh, the proposed law takes care of the recommendation made by the baba kalyani uh, uh, committee uh, wherein lot of changes uh, was proposed uh, Uh, by the committee for the ease of business, and it was proposed that SEJ should behave like two unit. If it is exporting, it should behave as uh, as exporter, and if it is supplying uh, to DTA, it should behave like a DTA. So we are hoping, of course, uh, uh, that the new law once it is implemented uh, by 30th September, it should take care of that. Apart from that, of course, uh, uh, with the advent of last two years, uh, we all of us, especially in the tech or consulting industries. and to some extent even in final uh, manufacturing also uh, companies are getting used to work from home in many aspects so so we are also hoping that that sej uh, the new law should take care of the uh, 
service industries demand on work from home clarity, uh, specifically from the SEJ, whether their tax holiday will get impacted or not. So yes, uh, we need to wait for that. So, so I'll jump into the uh, changes proposed in the customs. Uh, so one such <laughs> immediate changes is that definition of a proper officer, uh, which was uh, uh, amended retrospectively uh, uh, to provide that the DRI uh, officers audit and preventing uh, officers also will be considered as the profit, uh, proper officer and they will have a power to issue a SOPOS notice. Uh, so why that change was brought in is to overcome the recent decision of the Supreme Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Canon India, where uh, the Supreme Court has held that the DRI officer is not the proper officer who can issue a SOPOS notice. He can conclude his investigation, but the board has the existing provisions have not given power uh, to the board to appoint a DRA as a uh, proper officer. So, so because of which Supreme Court has shut down the so-called notices and post that there was part of uh, uh, cases before various high courts where SSC have moved the similar uh, writ petitions uh, uh, requesting for nullifying the uh, so-called notices and uh, courts have uh, high courts uh, various high courts have agreed uh, okay. that uh, in view of the uh, Supreme Court decision uh, that DRA officer will not be a proper officer to issue these so-called notices. To, so to overcome that there were several changes made uh, wherein the powers have been given to the board uh, and the principal commissioner and commissioners to specify the uh, uh, the DRI and other preventive officer as a class of person uh, who can also issue a pro notice. Second, other Mr. change. Mr. 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 Amit, that, sorry to stop you. By chance, if you are using your PPT, it's not yeah. moving. It's yeah. Yes, yes. So I'm on the first PPT. Okay. Uh, you, uh, you can see the PPT where the legislative changes is there. No, uh, we are able to see the first opening slide where it is okay, written Tenor Union Budget 2020. And please, yeah, let, me, uh, let me again say, Ali. Uh, sure. yeah. Please share. No, sir. So now can we see? A uh, scene and uh, your uh, explanation, please. Uh, yeah, so it is on, uh, the slide is which is changes in custom tariff from a specified date. And I've just moved uh, from the previous slide. That was not shown, sir. Only first slide. Okay. Now the, it has been unshared. Uh, um, yes, I am just. Uh... Please reshare it, sir. Yeah. We can now see. Yes, yeah, oh. but not in the full screen mode. But yes, yes, yes I am doing that. Uh, yeah. So legislative Perfect. changes. Yeah. Customs, uh, customs legislative. Yes. Uh, and so, madam so, is we... requesting Amit if you can uh, slow a bit. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll do that. Okay. Uh, so other key uh, changes which may not impact everyone is that uh, they have provided the time limit on the validity of the advanced shootings in customs. So earlier there was no time limit basically on the uh, the effective uh, period during which the advanced shooting once an SSE obtained uh, that can be valid. Uh, so, so they have provided a validity of three years uh, 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 for the advanced shooting unless there is a change in law or facts. Uh, these changes may not impact everyone, but it appears that it may be a beneficial change uh, to the field authority where uh, uh, post the advance ruling, there are uh, maybe new uh, new decisions of the courts and all where uh, the change in position, uh, there is a change in tax position and in such cases now uh, the ruling since it will be valid only for three years. So it can be beneficial for some cases. Uh, other key changes, uh, which is towards ease of doing businesses that they have completely revamped the uh, compliance mechanism in case of IGCR rules, which is basically import of uh, goods uh, at concessional rates, uh, wherein the importer's uh, specific class or specified importer can uh, import the duty-free goods and uh, subject to compliance of this IGCR rule, which is also made effective even for EOU units also. Uh, so there, uh, the uh, proposed changes uh, are basically they have done the complete automation, end-to-end -end automation. So earlier there were a lot of manual filings and all these manual filings were there at the port of import uh, with the jurisdictional officer. So now all such filings would be electronic. Uh, that is first thing. Then apart from that, they have also standardized the various forms uh, uh, which need to be filed by the uh, uh, by the taxpayer or importer because uh, the earlier again there were no uh, only few forms were specified but field authority in practical they used to uh, raise several queries and they used to follow their different different methods so so they are standardizing the form 
and also again those details also need to be filed on the common portal uh, lastly uh, instead of a quarterly return uh, they provide for monthly return but again that monthly return uh, would be filed on uh, a common portal as again the uh, earlier time where we used to send it uh, through email and uh, manual filing both so so these changes are a welcome change uh, because of the fact that now you can do it by sitting in your office uh, as against uh, uh, meet, meeting the officer and then filing clarifying so so these changes will go a long way in ease of doing from uh, uh, for the all these importers who are importing on this uh, this is key the second big change in terms of uh, the i would say custom duty rate is tariff is uh, tariff changes because what they did is that today when uh, if i i'm just talking in a common way, uh, term that if i have to identify a custom duty rate uh, the, we look for two things first we look for tariff rate and then again we need to look for if there are any general exemptions notification issue so like once a big notification is say 50 oblique 2017 Uh, so as a importer i am forced to look into both uh, tariff as well as the exemption notification and then in that exemption notification there are several uh, 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 notification several exemption entries where the rates of say dcd is the concessional rate is provided without any condition uh, so so for, for example say if tariff rate is 10% of for a particular product but by way of a exemption notification 50 oblique 2017 The rate is five percent, and you don't need to follow any condition. So even in those cases, also as an importer or taxpayer, we were forced to look into both the tariff as well as the uh, the, the notification. So so what government has done, they have proposed that all such exemptions, unconditional exemptions, will form part of a tariff itself from first May two thousand twenty two, and till date, till uh, from today till th- uh, uh, till thirtieth April. those exemptions would continue and from first may exemption entries will get deleted and it will become part of tariff so it is a big uh, uh, step i would say from ease of doing uh, business and also it will help uh, uh, in correctly assessing the customs duty uh, so so that is one apart from that uh, again government has done a rationalization based on the uh, inputs received from various ministry and also from the crowd sourcing uh, and they have done away with some 350 uh, exemptions on various product uh, that is uh, the second change also they have uh, also provided uh, certain uh, uh, effective rate uh, because as we are aware that they were last year they have brought in the customs uh, uh, new section which was 254a where uh, it was provided that any condition exemptions will have a validity of 2 uh, year uh, from the for, uh, from the following year so it was valid basically up to 31st march uh, from the uh, following year uh, so so uh, so what they did is they have uh, in this budget again they have notified specifically that what are the those entries uh, in that exemption which will get impacted and they have given a sunset clause so basically they have provided what would be which exemptions would be valid till 31st march 23 and which would be up to uh, 24 uh, that was one uh, key change again uh, uh, another key change as i already talked about is government is looking to strengthen the uh, manufacturing uh, industry and specifically industries who are manufacturing capital goods because as we have seen there are a lot of imports happening from china specifically on the capex side so government want to promote the the manufacturing industry engaged in uh, manufacture of capital goods so 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 what they are doing is they are trying to phase out the project import uh, uh, regulations and for the benefit of all the members who are not aware on uh, aware of what is project import scheme uh, uh, it is a scheme where you can register your project specific contract for import of goods with the customs um, after getting the essentiality certificate from ministry and pay custom duty at specific rate which is say 7 and 1/2% and then uh, uh, through general exemption it is 5%. So 5% dcd you will pay on project import and you don't you can classify all your import in the chapter 90. So 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 th- so this scheme was again uh, uh, heavily used by uh, industries uh, who are uh, who are basically catering to the domestic uh, uh, segment because you don't get to get epcg and any other benefit but this since project import is irrespective of your component mix your business mix whether you are exporting or domestic 
you can get this 5% benefit. So there were many importers or the industries who were setting greenfield projects or going for expansion uh, of their industrial units. They were using this and importing at 5% BCD. Uh, so, so government is phasing out this, uh, but what they did is they are, the uh, good thing they did is they are not phasing it out immediately. They have given a window to the industry that all project import, which is existing till date and where you get the project registered up to 30th September 22, you can claim the benefit of reduced rate of BCD say at 5% up to 30th September 23. So, so any import made under this scheme up to 30th September 23, you can get that concessional benefit. Post that, the rate of BCD under this project import scheme will stand at 7.5%, which will be basically in line with all other because there are very few uh, capex item which are subject to 10% uh, uh, and all. Uh, coming back to uh, specific changes, uh, as I talked about, there are a lot of changes made. Uh, Ma'am, if you're saying something, uh, uh, Mike is mute. I can continue. Uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Amit. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so, so, uh, so in line with uh, the uh, the government's Atmanirbhar uh, Bharat uh, vision, they have increased various rates to increase uh, to encourage the domestic manufacturing, and there are several uh, 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 rates or several products where the rate would immediately uh, be affected, which was from second February, and uh, there are many cases where the uh, rates would be affected from the from first April. So, so like one such example is on the imitation jewelry. The rates are immediately effective where they have provided uh, that 20% BCD would continue, but one has to pay minimum uh, 400 per kg um, uh, uh, rate also if that 20% uh, uh, is less than that. And then to again to promote the medical uh, uh, sector, uh, it, it is engaged in manufacturing uh, and also for raw material parts or for artificial kidney and other items, uh, again they have uh, uh, reduced the rate uh, to, G, uh, to nil. And so we can see that there are several changes made basically to promote uh, the, uh, they have increased the rate to promote the uh, uh, man local manufacturing. Uh, so there are several such examples where uh, the rates have been given again from 1st April. So, so again, they have given a window uh, to the uh, importer to plan their import and be aware of the uh, increased rate so that it doesn't impact their business immediately. So, so, so there are several such changes where, which will get uh, effective only from 1st April. So any import made from that day. Um, uh, so I'll just uh, immediately just rush through because these are just several items are there just to where the rates have been either increased or decreased. Uh, uh, coming back to uh, the sunset clause, as I was talking, uh, that uh, the uh, last year when this section 25 4A was introduced, they have provided that uh, that uh, that any benefits would be available only for up to 31st March following two years from the date of notification. And, uh, and it is good that government has uh, through this budget clarified and given the sunset clause. Because in general terms, we would not have noticed that, that we would, would be happy that, okay, we are importing this notification is already there. But we could not have linked this with section uh, 25, uh, which provided only for two-year validity. So, so government has now specifically put up these clarifications or they have amended the notification 50 and 52 of 2017 to provide this uh, sunset clause and impact. So again, um, you know, from that perspective, it brings a lot of clarity uh, so that the importers, they can plan their uh, imports. Uh, why it is still necessary because we could think that, okay, it is 22 and we are talking about uh, exemption ending in 23 or 24. So I have seen there uh, all this greenfield project or big projects, uh, manufacturing project that takes three or four years because gestation period is used to set up once you start planning. And if we are planning for setting up and we are factoring the rate, we should be aware of uh, uh, the changes made uh, uh, so that uh, we don't end up uh, uh, paying because there are a lot of arbitrage when we do planning on import versus domestic procurement and we factor uh, the effective uh, cost. So, so we should be aware of this sunset clause while uh, uh, planning. And government has clearly, uh, they have uh, given it uh, in the uh, notification itself that what would be the sunset law. Again, uh, this uh, phase manufacturing program uh, government has introduced uh, for the uh, wearable devices industry. Uh, then they have also uh, introduced for uh, 
uh, um, hearable uh, devices which are again like uh, your headphone or TWS, same way wearable devices are all smart watches and uh, this smart meter. So for government again to promote the, uh, the manufacturing industry, they have provided uh, the benefits on various parts on a graded manner. And they again the intention is to phase out the uh, benefits. So, so, so if we could see that it is start with the lower rate or exemption, and then it gradually over the period the uh, the rates have increased. So, so by the time uh, the local manufacturing industry uh, it start flourishing and it become independent. So, so, so that way it is a good uh, way out to promote the uh, uh, local manufacturing industry by having this uh, PMP for them. Uh, uh, then there are other uh, one more changes where it is uh, on the uh, social welfare uh, uh, Swachh Bharat says so this is again uh, uh, this was basically uh, uh, a clarification given in the budget uh, that the Swachh Bharat this says would on the uh, customs it would not apply uh, uh, on cases where the exemption BCD itself is exempt so so why it was coming because the general thought is that once the says any says which is computed say on the tax element and not on the basic values. So, so there is a difference. So maybe for the benefit of uh, all the participants, uh, maybe I can talk about what kind of says would be there. So one is say there is education says or health says or such bad says. So there are different kinds of says which applies on the duties. And then there is other says say the NCCD, national calamity says or automobile says which apply on the entire value of the goods. So, so the earlier, uh, the, the interpretation was that once the duty itself is nil, duty is exempt, uh, then this cess also would be exempted because uh, uh, because even if cess rate is say 10% on zero, it should be zero. So that's how the interpretation was there. But Supreme Court, uh, Honorable Supreme Court in Unicorn Industry, they have ruled otherwise. They said that uh, the exemption notification, one is it has to be strictly interpreted and Second is that exemption notification, if it is provided only for specific duty exemption, which is for example, BCD, uh, then this says which is applicable on that duty will not get automatically exempted uh, because of the fact that duty can still be determined by not considering the exemption and the computation can be there. So, so they have held that uh, says even in, in cases where the uh, duties are exempted would be payable. So to overcome this, uh, uh, because the, the intention was always that yes, uh, it should be exempted. So government has clarified that duty would be zero, uh, where the basis for computation of SWS is uh, nil, because aggregate duty is nil because of any other exemption notification. So, so this is again uh, uh, a good welcome measure. Then uh, the other changes are, they have again ended dumping duty has been revoked on a specialized steel products. Uh, uh, to overcome the difficulties uh, faced by the industry uh, uh, in the and then uh, similar is the case where the agricultural infrastructure development says and health says ratification rationalization has been done uh, to align those with the uh, BCD. Uh, then there are few changes made to align the tariff uh, like one was also done from 1st January if everyone is aware 1st January 22 also there were several changes made in uh, the custom tariff. So, so similarly, there were few amendments made to align the same uh, 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 from HS 2022, which is published by the World Customs Organization (WCO). Uh, uh, and in addition, there were few entries uh, uh, in uh, textile and chemical sector introduced to uh, based on the uh, uh, request from the ministry to clarify and uh, uh, help in correct identification of those products. So, so few uh, HSN have been specifically included. Uh, apart from that, as this government has been doing, uh, even with the laws where the, there are several laws which uh, have been repealed because they were obsolete. So same way, there were several notifications uh, which were obsolete and uh, uh, because of the fact that the, either the GST introduced or there are changes, those laws are no more in place or those exemptions have expired. So, so all this has been uh, um, uh, resigned uh, so that the exemptions are moved one doesn't need to go through all these exemptions. Uh, so, so, so it, again, it is a welcome step in, 
because it will help the taxpayer to identify what are the live uh, notifications which one has to see. Otherwise, we are always uh, we have to sometimes see the uh, see from some 20, 30 notification uh, to identify the effective duty. So, so it will uh, go in a good uh, uh, it will be a good direction uh, for the taxpayer also if uh, 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 one has to see only the specific limited notification. Uh, the other good clarification I would say is again uh, it was a long pending demand on the electric vehicle uh, where uh, they have clarified that the electric vehicle kit it, if it is imported in a CKD form um, then uh, uh, it is not necessary that every in the component of that kit uh, uh, should be disassembled. So it, uh, that is not a requirement because there were always challenge from field authority that it is not a uh, import in a CKD form and uh, uh, and duty application would vary. Uh, similarly, uh, other clarification they have said that if some components are missing, but the essential character of that CKD or SKD kit is that still it would be an EV uh, because all the essential character of EV is there uh, then that would again be assessed under uh, EV. So I'm hoping that this would also help in GST design because we have seen uh, uh, in uh, there are a couple of advanced holdings uh, issued by uh, the authorities uh, uh, where they have said that if there is battery is missing from an electric vehicle, it, it doesn't qualify as electric vehicle and subject to higher rate. Uh, so I hope that uh, similar clarifications are uh, issued under GST so that that will also help. Uh, um, uh, Coming back to the uh, GST amendments, uh, as uh, uh, all of us, we, we must be aware that the GST changes in the budget, those are more of a, uh, a uh, to implement the GST council decision, because now government, everything is a joint uh, uh, decision. So, so it is merely uh, to implement, uh, uh, we would say that to implement the decisions or recommendation of the GST councils, which needs to be carried out through the act. Uh, because as we are aware, if there is any changes in the notifications and all, those can be done uh, and there is no budget uh, 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 is required for uh, carrying out those changes. But as far as the legislation is concerned, yes, any recommendation uh, by the GST Council that need to be carried out through the budget uh, changes. And uh, same way now, once the union budget is passed, similar changes need to be done by the states also. Because we parallelly, uh, all of us are aware that we have CGST, we have a state GST Act also. So yes, those changes need to be incorporated and passed in uh, uh, state assembly also. Uh, so so, but uh, but as uh, Mr. Sudhir was saying that yes, there are several changes uh, which I will just discuss. So so we would feel that yes, there are many changes which already got implemented from first of January. But why this budget is there? Why it is proposed now? And again, since it is proposed, so there is a long way because it will get effective only for the notification date. Uh, so 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 just to answer that. Uh, yes, uh, one could take a position that since the legal backing in terms of amendment and act has been given now, so so there's a scope that people can challenge uh, whether those changes are impacting any eligibility uh, uh, prior to this amendments getting notified, uh, because these are all uh, effective from uh, date to be notified. So so yes, uh, to give the legal backing, these changes have been proposed. Uh, so one such. Uh, change uh, which is a critical change I would say and uh, not an industry friendly change is that um, they have amended in section 16 of the uh, CGST act to say that IDC shall not be eligible unless the outward supply details are auto generated and it is not only auto generated but uh, but it should not be restricted in the to be so 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 now uh, uh, they have also given certain examples where uh, uh, so now basically what would happen is when we are getting a 2B, it will have uh, say two component. One is that where credit IDC is available and other component would be IDC not available. Also they have tried, uh, they have provided in the act amendment that what all uh, you know, cases that IDC would not be available or restricted. So like one such case is newly registered person for period as may be specified. So again, uh, it is a cooling period. So, so, so they are trying to say that if some new, you have procured a goods from a, 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 a supplier who has just recently got registered, government want to ensure that probably uh, they see that compliance by those taxpayers uh, and then uh, then provide the, the ITC to the uh, uh, to the recipient. So, so it is sort of a cooling period. Uh, there is no clarity. Uh, today, because we are yet to once these provisions get uh, 
uh, notified, uh, we will see that relevant rules are issued because this uh, for this there is no rule as of now. Uh, as of now, we have seen two B is already there, but this restrictions what they have notified now, uh, there is no uh, uh, specific rule. So we need to wait for cooling period. Uh, second is uh, again they have talked about persistent default in the payment of tax by a vendor. So so uh, if you are buying from a vendor who is always defaulting in tax payment, again credit would be restricted. Um, uh, then again, uh, they have talked about in case where you uh, you are again buying uh, from a vendor whose GST liability in GSTR one exceeds from three B, which means that always three B liability, which is ultimately paid to the government, is lower than the liability disclosed in GSTR one. Uh, then again, another change is credit availed in excess of the prescribed limit. So as we are aware, that they have already prescribed certain cases where uh, like. 1% uh, 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 liability need to be paid in cash, uh, so which is the other one. And the seven-year credit in excess of prescribed limit is a case again where a, a taxpayer is availing credit more than 2B. Uh, again, they would provide what would be the percentage of uh, that tolerance limit. So, so we, as, a, as on date, there is no clarity on that aspect. Uh, and then again, any other pres uh, prescribed class of person. So, so again, they have kept it open. Uh, so, so one key message which is coming from this is that they are putting onerous uh, 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 obligation on the uh, recipient. So now recipient, uh, earlier also, yes, as a recipient, uh, they have cast the obligation that we should follow up with the supplier and ensure that supplier is complying with the, uh, the GST provisions. But it was still uh, to some extent restricted to that, yes, I should, those uh, invoices were getting reported into a uh, and those vendors were filing uh, their 3B. So it was like, uh, I am getting the uh, the vendor, all my vendor invoices uh, auto-populated in 2A and I also see their compliance on website also and see that yes, uh, uh, one uh, GSTR 1 and 3B is fine. Uh, but if you, we see that now what they are doing is they have put so many if and buts. So, so it is like they are providing that, that vendor liability uh, or payment in uh, uh, in through three B should not uh, should always be equal or should be more than GSTR one. So now as a recipient, we will not have a visibility on uh, many of those conditions because we will not know what is his status whether his uh, liability paid through GSTR three B is more or less than GSTR one. Similarly, we will not have whether his GSTR three B credit is more or less than two B. Uh, then another example is uh, that. 2B, there can be differences between credit in 3B versus 2B in various cases. For example, uh, 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 there can be a cases where I have not availed the credit in 2B, even though there are certain invoice in 2B, I may I will defer that credit to the next month. So, 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 so uh, for various reasons, something can be if I don't have, I have not received the goods, I cannot take credit. So again, I will defer. So, so till today, there is no clarity how this will behave and how all these conditions will be monitored through GSTN. Also, we don't have a clarity on as a recipient, how I will get the visibility to ensure this. So it is basically putting entire onus on recipient uh, that uh, that he has to get into basically suppliers compliance to ensure everything. So, so, so this is, of course, not industry uh, um, uh, uh, friendly amendment and uh, it appears to be a little on the harsher side. Uh, uh, also, uh, I am sure that there would be many assessors who, is, uh, who are going to challenge this uh, because earlier also like there are a couple of decisions uh, even in the GST design where uh, the high courts have said that first uh, uh, endeavor of the department should be to recover the taxes from the supplier and then uh, go back to recipient if they are not able to recover. But it should always be collected from the um, seller and not from buyer. Uh, and then VAT design, we have uh, like Supreme Court decision also, High Court decision also, uh, 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 in many cases uh, where the uh, courts have categorically held that the VAT input credit, uh, which as a buyer, genuine buyer, if I have claimed the input credit on the genuine purchases, uh, that cannot be recovered from the buyer on default of uh, supplier. So, so we have legal precedent under VAT design few precisions under uh, GST. So of course, I think there would be a lot of rate precisions, I'm sure, uh, once this rule is implemented in its true spirit, because it is going to cause a lot of uh, hardship uh, to the SSEs, uh, because it's difficult to implement. Uh, uh, the other key change, uh, maybe uh, now that the second one is at least beneficial provision. Uh, 
uh, that they have extended the time limit for ITC availment. So as of all of us, we must be aware that we need to get the credit uh, ITC on any invoice for a particular year. We can claim by 30th September or uh, filing of GST annual return, whichever is earlier. So, so, so the earlier window was available up to 30th September. So basically the return filing date for September month. Uh, now they have extended that to 30th November. Uh, so, so which appears to be the uh, extension of two months. And uh, uh, of course it is a uh, welcome measure, I would say. Uh, similar uh, change they have done with respect to credit note. So, so, uh, so if we are issuing a credit note, GST credit note again, I'm talking about where say on account of it can be on account of sales return or it can be on account of uh, the pre-agreed discounts uh, where uh, or any price variations which uh, for which credit notes are being issued in line with the GST provision. So earlier date was that it has to be issued uh, by the uh, reporting period of uh, the September return. Uh, whereas now they have provided the 30th November date. So, so here there is a slight change because the, the way language of uh, the rule uh, section 34 is that it talks about reporting, uh, uh, reporting period of September return earlier as against with reporting period, uh, which is ending on 30th November. So, so all of us, uh, like one interpretation is that uh, if all of us, we are, uh, we are aware that yes, if you have to file an October return, that would be filed by 20th November. Uh, uh, but suppose if there is a November return, it can be filed only by uh, 28 uh, December. So, so one way of that, since it talks about the reporting period, which means that this credit notes this can be disclosed only in the October return, which is getting filed by 30th November uh, maximum. Uh, of course, that would be a delay and it is not, of course, <laughs> advised to file the return. So, which means that effectively uh, uh, for credit note, we have got another month. Uh, that is one way of uh, interpretation that instead of uh, 30th uh, September or September return, I, we can adjust in the November, uh, October return. Uh, so that is, uh, but still we got extra time and these got again backed up from the uh, law committee recommendation in the 40th, uh, 43rd GST council meeting, uh, where uh, we could see the agenda where they have also discussed and deliberated on that. And they said that, yes, it will provide another month extra month to the industry to uh, make the changes avail the credit or uh, um, so 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 uh, yes uh, still it is a uh, fr industry friendly measure and uh, it will give uh, a month extra and it is of course uh, it is good because many cases we have seen that audited accounts income tax return everything is getting finalized in many cases by october or so 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 we got one month extra and it is good uh, uh, another thing is they have said again that self versus ITC need to be uh, revert, uh, reversed in case where supplier is not paying. And they have provided that we can again reavail those credits. So, so this were earlier in line with when, uh, when there was a proposal or the provisions were there that we need to, uh, if uh, the vendor is not uh, reporting in two months period, then we need to reverse with interest. So, so this is similar to that. Uh, but again, there appears to be some contradiction. Uh, because uh, at one place they are saying that if a vendor has not paid the taxes, uh, I am not allowed to take the input credit. But at the same time, they, uh, the, uh, they are uh, saying that yes, if I have availed, we will reverse. So we need to see how both the provisions uh, 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 get merged. Because it is, uh, because always there will be time lag between GST and 2B because that is the data generated on 11th or 12th morning. Uh, so yes, there's always the possibility to uh, claim credit without realizing that that vendor may not uh, uh, pay, uh, so for which we will get penalized. Uh, then uh, again, there are certain procedural changes made, uh, which is again to align. Like for example, cancellation, they have said that for composite uh, dealer, since it was always an annual return. So for them, uh, cancel, uh, succession, successive uh, filing of returns was not there, it is annual filing. So they said that, yes, uh, annual, if within three months, annual return is not filed by the composition dealer, their registration can be cancelled. And other cases, uh, uh, they have provided their continuous tax period would be prescribed. So to, today it is six months, but then they have said, uh, instead of that, they are proposing that uh, continuous tax period can be prescribed. So, so we need to see what would be those period. Uh, then a few again changes made uh, specifically again it is a facilitation measure for the electronic cash ledger. So so like earlier they have said that uh, uh, that yes we can transfer uh, the uh, uh, cash ledger so any CGST, SGST or IGST uh, within this, uh, the the distinct person. So so if say for example I have only paid uh, uh, GST in state A 
uh, and gas and I don't have a utilization and uh, it was a mistake. I can now transfer those uh, uh, cash leisure balances to distinct person. Of course, subject to uh, condition that there should not be any unpaid liability. But again, this is a uh, welcome measure. And uh, other thing is they have also provided late fee for delayed filing of TCS return uh, uh, and uh, which is for the e-commerce uh, and all. Uh, uh, then again, one more uh, procedural uh, changes is that they have provided specifically that what would be the relevant date for claiming refund on supplies by SCJ, uh, supplies to SCJ or uh, SCJ unit or developer. Uh, because earlier there were no re specific relevant date provided. Uh, so as we are, all of us are aware that refund can be claimed within two years and that two years is from the relevant date. So since there was no uh, relevant date prescribed in the GST law, uh, people, you know, I mean, SSCs used to, uh, or department used to say that it's a date of tax payment and there used to be dispute. So now they have categorically said that it should be within uh, uh, two years from the date of filing uh, of GSTR 3B for uh, such uh, uh, return in which those supplies are uh, basically disclosed by uh, uh, the supplier. Uh, and then again, another change is that GSTR 1, now they have changed uh, and amended uh, to provide the GSTR 1. Uh, cannot be filed if you have not filed uh, uh, any previous returns. Also, they have said GSTR 3B cannot be filed uh, if you have not filed GSTR uh, 1 of the uh, uh, 1. So, so you cannot proceed to file GSTR 3B unless you file GSTR 1. So, so these are all procedural uh, changes, but to strengthen the compliances. Um, uh, uh, so, so the last one would be that the SCJ we have already discussed. So, so we need to of course wait and watch because today we don't have uh, any uh, draft legislation. Also, that what is government uh, uh, would, would be proposing on the SCJ law. But yes, uh, uh, we are expecting that this law would strength would ease the compliances because today, as we are aware, uh, like uh, there are several compliances uh, uh, if one is in SCJ unit. And of course, there are streaming compliances if there are any clearances made from SCJ to DTA or if goods are temporarily moved outside. So, so there are enormous compliances and compliance burden is more. And then as my friends have talked about earlier also that yes, uh, 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 there is a lot of uh, um, MBPT today uh, uh, earlier on the SCJ that uh, uh, because of the fact that DTA, if I am selling anything in DTA, uh, customs duty need to be paid. So, so we are expecting that yes, new law will uh, be in line with the Kalyani Baba Kalyani Committee um, uh, recommendation, and it should help in ease of business where the uh, the foreign investor or any investor uh, domestic or foreign. If we are setting up a unit in SCJ, we should not be uh, bogged down by the fact that okay, I, we need to reach, uh, uh, we need to have a maximum export. It should be friendly where if I am, I don't have a market say because of whatever reason uh, for export, I could do the business. Uh, uh, without any hesitation and supply to the DTA market without the impact of the BCD. Because today, uh, when we import, when we supply from SCJ to DTA, it is the customs duty on the finished uh, uh, goods value which need to be paid, and which is a deterrence today for uh, uh, sale by uh, SCJ to DTA. So uh, then, uh, the other thing is they have already said that the entire administration of SCJ from custom perspective should be on the common. Uh, uh, national portal. So again, this is a welcome step uh, because today it is like we have to uh, go through NSDL and uh, uh, the SCJ online portal and now it will be integrated uh, with the customs portal. So so that is again a welcome measure so that it will again uh, have a e uh, ease of business. And apart from that, though not an indirect tax, but as a uh, investment impetus, they have all announced the extra uh, PLI scheme. They have said that they would be pronouncing this scheme for design and manufacturing for a 5G ecosystem. Um, and also they have allocated almost 19,500 crore uh, for the high efficiency solar module manufacturing. Uh, so, so again, this will help in, um, in uh, uh, boosting this industry, uh, solar, uh, specifically solar power industry. And the last is, yes, I can just talk about maybe a few uh, misses uh, or unfinished agenda. What we think is, of course, uh, first one is not, it, it is everyone's, uh, uh, this list that yes, petroleum products should be included in GSC. Uh, so that will always be there on the top of the list uh, because benefit would be huge to the industry. Uh, once the fuel is uh, petroleum products are part of GSC uh, ecosystem, uh, th there will be credit which is going to the manufacturing units or businesses who are using that in the course of furtherance. So it will uh, uh, be a positive for industry if uh, this is included. 
but from of course from the government uh, uh, perspective yes there are a lot of revenue concern because petroleum uh, products are heavily taxed uh, uh, both by state and center so, so that is the reason of uh, uh, still going back to the commitment which was originally for five year so we have to see how exactly it will pan out uh, second which we were expecting the, uh, that last two years all the companies we have also seen they are spending lot of amount on the covid related thing uh, like uh, many of, most of the corporates they have uh, from their own they have uh, they have incurred the expenditure on uh, covid related testing or providing the extra allowances purchases to employees and all so a lot of those expenses were uh, subject to gst so so there is still ambiguity on uh, that whether gst uh, credit can be taken or not because many of them will be for the employee welfare or as a part of csr uh, so, so so there was always expectation that government should clarify and provide for their eligibility uh, so that was not there Uh, the third one uh, was uh, again we have seen gst resign that uh, there are several advance ruling uh, issued by different different authorities and many of such advance rulings are contrary to each other for example there is an advance ruling issued in case of notice pay uh, where uh, the few recent notice uh, advance rulings have said that notice pay would not be subject to gst but then again there are advance ruling which says notice pay uh, is uh, a supply and uh, subject to gst similar cases exist in employees recovery where Uh, many of the advance ruling authorities have held that a recovery from employees towards uh, catering or transportation or any other expenses is a supply gst should be payable and there are other authorities which have held otherwise uh, so so yes the expectation was that government should set up a national appellate uh, tribunal which they have earlier announced uh, but nothing is there on the uh, thing and last key was the gst appellate tribunal which we are waiting for last five year uh, because today if we have any adverse decision say from the lower authority we go to the commissioner appeal so joint commissioner after that still tribunal is not there because existing tribunal is only uh, for taking care of the old pre gst uh, matters so so there is no gst appellate tribunal as of now and assessees are forced to uh, file writ petitions in case of demand and we have many cases where there are refund matters sometimes assessee are not keen to uh, uh, go to high court Uh, and uh, for whatever reason, or there are many cases where dispute amount would not be high, and going to high court will always entail more cost. Uh, so, so there are various reasons where uh, uh, assessees today are suffering uh, because of non-setting up of their GST appellate tribunal. So, so that is a big miss. And uh, in spite of uh, high courts uh, have uh, directed government to set up that, so there is no word on that. So, with that, uh, I will close my session. Thank you so much. thank you amit i think it was a very extensive uh, presentation which was given by you in terms of the coverage for uh, indirect taxes is uh, concerned uh, the major uh, concern uh, which the industry should now be geared up and be prepared for is the new proposed condition for availing the credit where uh, 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 the credit should not be restricted in in terms of newly proposed section 38 uh, for the vendor so a small background for the benefit of the few members uh, who wanted to understand this particular issue which is of more uh, more uh, relevant for each one of us so i would like to spend few minutes there so initially uh, the law was drafted having a matching concept uh, amit made it very clear a two way communication was been planned where i would file my gstr 1 which will go and sit in my customer gstr 2 by chance if i am not filed he can put it that it is going to come and put in my 1a and auto populates in my gstr 1 so that was a beautiful concept uh, i am not very sure uh, that was having a lot of protest and they had to undo this undo this uh, 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 provision which was there uh, in the term not in terms of undo they did uh, they uh, made it inoperative later what they told us that if there is an invoice you take the credit based on your 3b only an amount you put no break up also to be given how this amount has come only an in internal records but uh, they also introduced gstr 2a but that was not having any powers uh, per se to uh, 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 enforce that there is a requirement to take a credit only when it is part of 2a they also introduced 2b then also there was no powers uh, first of january 2022 the powers has been given based on the previous uh, budget amendment where only if it is part of your 2b you could take the credit now there is an another condition which has been there what the government realized is that how a credit is coming and sitting in gstr 2b the moment a vendor is uploading gstr 
it is coming and sitting in my tobi that doesn't require payment of tax please mind so i'll upload my gst r1 either i will not upload my gst r3 b or I'll upload it with a lower amount because again next month i will not be able to file i'll apply it with whatever the amount the cash flows is permitted available to that extent i'll upload my customer is keep on going getting credit but government is not getting the revenue so now there was also a mechanism where they bought it in the previous budget only saying that if there is a difference between 1 and 3b whatever the amount is deemed to be a self assessment and they go for an auto recovery so actually a sufficient tool was sufficient sufficient information was available with the department where they could have gone for a provisional attachment recovery and things like that it would have been very very easy but still government want don't want to put efforts they want us to do all the efforts for them and give everything in a platter so considering this what they are now saying is no no if you are vendor having a difference between 1 and 3 be more than permissible limit as may be prescribed then to some extent of the uh, is gst r1 which is auto populated in your dubi or any new returns which they make they will tell that it is not available for credit because maybe there is a short payment so thereby although it is appearing in your to be because it is not paid by your vendor you will not be eligible to take the credit because the condition of 16 is not getting fulfilled same what they have done is also input tax credit now vendor also has to take an input tax rate based on his to be but what in 3b if he is ignoring the auto populated of 2b even a red mark is appearing he will put more amount and take the credit then also it becomes ineligible for the recipient to take the credit so thereby they are now putting more onus and uh, more uh, restriction on the vendor uh, all these days uh, we were uh, looking at uh, uh, grooming the vendor or uh, bothered about the vendor compliance now this new condition requires vendors vendor compliance also to be ensured as because if he is not uploading my my vendor will not get the credit and he will not be able to file the returns and that becomes an ineligible problem so where is an end for it we are not very sure about it unless until the economy is booming so much cash flows are sufficiently available all transaction is happening up front for uh, payment no uh, due uh, long uh, pendencies of payment maybe that is where something a solution can be there for this as a gst uh, matching concept which uh, uh, not the matching concept but to a to be concept uh, and not actually as a gst solution one of the major challenge which comes is the government is the biggest defaulter government as a customer is a biggest defaulter many of you would be uh, making lot of uh, supplies to government and uh, i don't say default de there are uh, late payers there are few states they have not paid for one and a half two years they have not paid the create the bill then there is where is a cash flow of a contractor getting subcontractor getting and where how is that they are going to do a compliance this budget has no answers for that but they are only putting lot of conditions on us to do the compliance making business more and more challenging and critical so this is the point which i wanted to add it to uh, amit's presentation yes of course uh, the greatest expectation this year was to have a clarity on the tribunal gst tribunal which has not been there because lot of pendency of issues have come up orders have been passed by the commissioner appeals and uh, those things are pending like that and some cases there is a refund cases where you have to go for a writ petition writ petition at least demand you can leave it at that we will see what is going to happen so it is increasing the lot of cost there was a, a, a decision which has been pending where it was been questioned because of uh, Uh, want of having a equal judicial member it was a ratio of 2 is to 1 two technical and one judicial member uh, and thereby there was a stay on the uh, operation of the uh, this uh, tribunal we were expecting some budget amendment to come here uh, have some uh, amendments to this uh, tribunal related provision so that this anomaly can be removed in view of the high court stay which has been given Uh, and thereby the tribunal will become functional so it is a disappointing that the tribunal is not there i agree with amit that is one of the biggest miss of this particular budget so these were the few points which i thought uh, in addition to amit i will add uh, value to the members yeah amit you wanted to uh, speak something maybe no, no, so yes absolutely you put in right that lot of uh, onus now or the entire onus which government was supposed to do in terms of recovery has been put on the uh, industry 
uh, and uh, entire chain. So if there is a manufacturing company which engages a distributor, distributor to dealers and dealer to sub dealers, I think they will get uh, get heavily impacted and dependent on each other's compliance. Yes. So thank you. So there are some questions which is flowing on. Please, uh, please use uh, the Q and A box for uh, posing your questions and not the chat box. Uh, please use uh, the uh, Q and A box. Uh, Mr. Kamlesh, there is one question for you. Uh, kindly elaborate implication of VDA exchange. Right, I'm, I'm around. Um, just a minute. Am I audible? Yes, sir. So um, now the VDA needs to be looked at how, like how you would actually look at a capital asset, right? Now, the transfer of a capital asset under the Income Tax Act leads to capital gain. And there are allied provisions which tax cap gains short term, long term. Um, the only difference with the VDA is that there'll be no short term or long term. It will be treated a taxable asset, which is charged to tax at 30% plus plus. Um, it remains to be seen on the fine print whether 37% is applicable or that 15% is applicable. I do not see a 15% um, rate being applicable to this thing, right? Now that's on the taxability. Now, what happens when you exchange? The same thing that happens when you exchange a capital asset, right? Um, if you look at the definition of transfer in a capital asset, it talks about sale, transfer, exchange. The same way, a VDA, when exchanged, will still lead to a taxable event at 30% or the gain. Um, now, you might ask me a question. Um, if I exchange for less than consideration, what would happen? Which essentially means that um, I'll give my kid a VDA. Let's say I have Bitcoins. I'll give it to my kid at, let's say, 10 years down the line. I want to give it to him. What will happen? There's a provision 56 to 10, which sort of, I mean, kid is a wrong example because anyway, your transfers to kids are taxed. If you want to give it to a relative, um, 56 to 10 trigger will happen, which essentially means that when you transfer an asset to somebody at less than consideration or less than fair market value, there'll be a taxable event at 30%. When they sell it, there'll be another taxable event at 30%. There is no credit mechanism that has been provided. So there will be a double taxation. So right now, the way it looks is that it is draconian, the way it is worded. But you know, but to be honest, um, it's a great change of attitude till now, till six months before. She was talking about banning crypto coins. They never liked it. Now they have realized that it spread so far and wide. Um, when people are mining cryptocurrency, a lot of Indians have actually bought equipment which sort of mines cryptocurrency. And there is discussions going on on how to tax them. Uh, so right now she's come around and she wants to tax this at 30%. Next is the RBA rules around VDA that will come up. Yeah. <laughs> Any other question, please? I think um, Mr. Prem Kankaria wants to ask a question. Yeah, can I join in discussion, please? Mr. Kamesh, Mr. Sudhir. <laughs> now, what you are talking of VDA, yes. virtual, I think probably I, I differ in that because there are two things in that. They are not classified as I said. What they would, uh, she said is, at the moment, we are not clear. So what... Uh, we want it basically because nobody has declared this sort of profit in the year. They say that we have scrutinized all the returns is there. Nobody has shown any crypto profit. So they say that as of now, we are not classified as asset. But whosoever is showing is a profit, it will be charged as a 30% and no loss. So he clearly said, chairman of the CBDT, that loss is your profit is ours, pay the tax. That's all. Beyond that, he has not dealt because it is neither is it legalized nor is it regulated as of now. So that oh. is what the, my perception is there. Yeah, you are right in a way. You are right in a way. When, but when you are talking of the transfer and all these things, it is not there. Because it is not, not there. classified as I said. No, but, but the fact of the matter is that the whole purpose of getting something which is untaxed into the tax stream itself is that tomorrow there will be a notification. Most times in the last four or five years, Budgets have only said as much. There are notifications yeah, right, which are followed no, the section. They already clarified yesterday that they are bringing out the law and it will be brought in as early as possible. Correct? 
so yeah, right. then they are if, if they are not legalizing it also that crypto maybe they are bringing it a uh, uh, rupee uh, digital currency then automatically the crypto will go and that will be illegal so then they say that we will uh, uh, be guided by the new whatever is there and then 30% tax will be withdrawn that is what is contention but that is what secretary has said yesterday yeah. but i this regarding my I humbly, crypto yeah i am really back to differ with you because i do not think crypto will go away to be honest because it's there to stay but that's a discussion for some other day mr ramde yeah. gudara wants to say absolutely, something absolutely absolutely correct no i have one another question for you uh, uh, and mr. i want to join with and i would like sir. that gudara ji and all presidents are joining in the discussion see what we have been talking that uh, government has not given an incentive they are not increase uh, this thing is there uh the thinking at the government which i probably can hear it and then i also feel it is correct that they want to drive away the people from incentives they want the people should straight away pay the taxes so there's no benefit i have a calculations i tell you we were below 15 lakhs if you are taking a incentive atc or whatever is there you are loser so below 15 lakhs you straight away pay the tax then you are gainer and above 15 lakhs then you can offer that incentive and then you save the tax so thereby they want to say that even if you increase it who will get benefit the people above 15 lakhs to whom they they want to, they don't want to give any benefit so that is the whole idea of that what see there has been lot of that government has not given benefit not given see that basically is a direct is a continuity and credibility that is what they are talking of and i stand for that and that is what they have not given any this thing in case an atc or in case an atd of course see from a social point of view social major point of view uh, medical benefit they should have some way they have increased it that's i feel it personally but otherwise there is no point and they are right in that they don't want they drive away the people from the incentive that's why my perception thank you prem sir i think yeah, uh, ramdev sir so one point one another point regarding this uh, updated returns Uh, there is a clause in that that when uh, assessment is over, say one forty three one assessment is over, then probably you cannot file it. No updated, Mr. Kamish. Yes, you are right. It says you cannot have the same matter as a subject of assessment or reassessment. To be honest, one forty three one already assessment has been done because normally they are issuing it. No, so when it is there, yeah, then so you can't file it. No. Yeah, you can't file it. So that's right. the thing. the whole purpose of this provision is lost because the time limits for issuing a scrutiny notice on 1431 or 1432 are very short right now and exactly correct and the condition of one year and two years is also quite short it's not very big so i don't know how these two will work because honestly it defeats the whole purpose <laughs> of the provision if you yeah i mean it, is, it looks to be it looks to be a redundant provision i think it has not got any benefit And yesterday, when CBT chairman was talking, and his senior is asked, "Say the why you are giving? Then you want to give an open assessment? Give it three year, four years. Let the people come out." He said, "The people cannot wake up in two years. Why should I give more than time?" But then the provision itself is a probably not a practical one, as I feel. Yeah. So once yes. assessment order is issued, then you can't file updated. You're right. You're right. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you. Ramesh sir, please go ahead. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Sudhir. Just I would like to add to the queries raised by Kankariya ji regarding this uh, virtual digital asset. It has been defined in section two. It is not relating to cryptocurrency per se. It says something else. Probably it may cover that also. first thing because exchange of any information token code like this it has been worded so we should not be under any confusion that it is only relating to cryptocurrency or whatever it and another thing while delivering a budget speech finance minister has clearly told that she doesn't consider it as any currency currency means any thing which has been issued by the central bank of any country that is how first thing and second thing regarding taxability that 30% tax is reasonable because it is a sort of uh, speculation 
in my view. Of course, everyone has got their own view. <laughs> even, even, even any gift made for value exceeding fifty thousand rupees, it is taxable in the hands of the recipient, as Kamesh was telling under fifty six to ten. So the, we should not have any grudge with that because, after all, for our economy, that is not the proper thing. First thing, and regarding this, uh, uh, you are saying uh, any other other issue you were having. Regarding this, uh, what was your question, Kankaraya ji? Second one. Regarding the incentives. Incentives. Exemptions and incentives. I was talking. Ah. Not so, not a question. No, I was not, I was just I was taking a participation. That's all. Crypto See, also. Yeah. I don't have any question. Huh? I See, just wanted to participate. Your observation, of course, you were observing. Yeah. See, so regarding this, incentives doesn't... also, because I think mm. lot of press release and all these things are there. The people mm. are misled by that that they have not provided any benefit. So then See, deliberately they have kept it out, and I, See, right so. This was my thing, observation. Ah, uh, in my view, one thing we should consider: they have not tinkered with any tax rate. Correct. Absolutely. They would have even increased. But rationality, I was searching for rationality rather than tinkering with tax rates. One thing I would say: when startups have been taxed at fifteen percent. Why not same thing be brought to partnerships? First thing, very second, question, yeah. partnership is very high rate. Agree. Second, second thing, this tax tablet for persons who are claiming deductions is really irrational. Right, straight away from five percent, it has jumped to twenty percent. In between, there is no other tax rate. So this present CBDT chairman Mohapatra ji, as you may be aware. He worked here as principal chief commissioner in Telangana and Andhra. So personally, as Lakshmi Madam is aware, we have good rapport with him because he has joined in various meetings with us. So he is not like that pers personally, as far as I know. Only thing is that the government has some other big plan. Maybe in my view, politically they are waiting for opportune time to give more incentives to individuals such as. Before 2024 election, so let us wait for 2023. The Bhutra ji, see, mm -hmm. the, basically you see be, below 15 lakhs, even if they increase it, is not getting benefit because tax rates are so low. <laughs> you Sir? see, calculate. I have a chart. I have my employees. Sir? They are below 15 lakhs. We calculate it. Then finally find it. Okay, it's better to uh, you keep aside the exemption and pay the state way. You have a calculate. I have a chart. That's what I'm. Sir, that is what they have not done it. So even if they increase it, he will not get benefit. Person below fifteen lakhs will not. And what I agree, Kankaraya ji. I fully agree. I see, ninety-six percent or ninety-seven percent return are being filed below ten lakhs. I fully agree, sir. What you are uh, saying. All the thing is that when government is showing expenditure of around thirty-nine point five lakh crore with estimated receipts at twenty-two point seven lakh crore. From where the balance will come? Only through IP of uh, IP of LIC, it is not going to come. So savings are must. My view is there. So that would have been boosted first thing. And regarding this creation of confusion by having two different tax structures, it is really confusing because for particularly business people, once they opt for that, uh, they can't re revert back to another. So why these all confusions? After all, simplification should be the motto. Agreed, agreed, agreed. They are they are anticipating uh, more saving, no? The small saving they are anticipating at least fifty to twenty percent increment. Then why oh, I tell you yes. the reason so? Because you and me, where is the choice? We have to go for uh, NPS. We have, to, we have to go for the small saving. Where do we get the interest from otherwise? So people are by force have to sow, mm. not for incentives now. The things have changed. Yes. Anyway, regarding we have other day for debate. regarding this updation of return, sir, don't think that it is any sort of uh, benefit or uh, privilege given. It is a sort of warning. You do it because lot of data is there with the department because of their infra whatever it may be. They are unable to go for proper mining of the data. 
they are providing the opportunity to you voluntarily you come forward before we do anything pay the tax this is a so by door sir this is a this is a, this is a back door amnesty here yeah? this is what somebody is told to call yesterday is a back door naturally na sir naturally see yeah yeah correct there will be a gain at another person's cost so if you don't want to involve yourself into any sort of wrangles better do it off normally small tax payer they will be happy to do that right for example a salaried class person who has forgotten to disclose his interest income from bank there is no harm for him to pay something because if he approaches any professionals like us he will end up in paying higher fees in all sort of litigations so for such people it is a good thing But don't but say that it is a chance because salary return immediately assessment is done, so we will not have a chance. Sir, only so for those persons. There is exception is there, na? No? One assessment is there, he cannot file. Sir, it is now in AIS. Everything is appearing. Uh, sir, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Prem sir and uh, Ramdev sir. I yeah, please. Now, please. Only, a, only a dialogue. Please, sir. Yeah, mind it up. Mind it up. Please. Opportunity for. Uh, members to express their doubts yeah uh, amit there is an interesting question now we are speaking about uh, uh, virtual currency uh, being taxed a virtual digital asset being uh, taxed uh, for the purpose of income tax mr premnath is asking what is the fate of gst so do you want to take that i also have my views but uh, yes, i don't want I, you to go first i uh, see the, uh, the as uh, the earlier speaker he has also talked about uh, mr ramdev Also, that uh, the cryptocurrency, if specifically we are talking about that, it is not a legal tender, uh, uh, so it is it cannot be categorized as a money because as we know, transaction in money or uh, means uh, the money is excluded from the definition of goods. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, or it, as of now, government stand is very clear that uh, uh, that they are not considering crypto as a legal uh, tender. Uh, so, so, so yes, uh, it, uh, it can be considered as goods, but uh, debate is still going on that whether it. can classify as goods or not uh, but from the perspective yes it is transferable uh, it can be uh, uh, traded uh, so it can be treated as some sort of a intangible uh, property and uh, permanent transfer of that can be treated as uh, subject to uh, i mean supply of goods so so that is the prima facie view but uh, the other view is suppose if somebody is dealing like the crypto exchange and all so so it would be like similar to the commodity exchange where like uh, on their services and all there are uh, there is already gst applicable on those charges so so similar to that as per the exchange uh, on their earnings or charges which they recover yes uh, uh, that would be treated supply uh, but whether the crypto currency value itself or uh, the values uh, whether that can be entirely subject to gst or not uh, it is still debatable and uh, already G, uh, dgci uh, they have issued several notices uh, to all the uh, major players and investors Investigation is going on, uh, so at this stage, yes, it's a quite debatable, and uh, there is no one view. I would say. Uh, yeah, uh, Amit, more or less, I agree with uh, the thought process of yours. Uh, but what I feel is, uh, yeah, before I come to the budget changes as far as the crypto or the virtual digital asset is concerned, uh, coming to the GST, how we may have to look at is that uh, GST. It has been told, which is uh, not an immovable property, is a uh, goods. subject to certain exclusion which is there service is very 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 dynamically different anything other than goods is service yes so now it is without any brainer that it is a, a cryptocurrency is not a immovable property and it is having a value and it is transferable so it will become a goods and by chance we argue something for that saying that it is not a goods and automatically it falls under the service so it becomes a very 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 indefinite for us to look into it but what uh, this amendment of the uh, uh, proposed amendment in the finance bill uh, defining virtual digital asset is also made somewhere clear that the intrinsic value there has to be a value which is and if i want to link this that the value which has been there an intrinsic value with the uh, decisions of the uh, tata consultancy services or many other decisions which is there it more or less now settling that for the purpose of gst also Uh, taking a cue from the income tax act it will become quite uh, goods but when it coming to taxation there are a lot of still gray areas uh, uh, on to be conservative i go with amit and say charge gst at 18% and it is going to spoil the entire trading uh, ecosystem itself but if you look at the criteria which is not clear is what is the classification of it whether my customs tariff act as a classification for an virtual asset 
so it cannot be there it will come anywhere it should come anywhere in a particular chapter it says any chapter and this is the rate which has been there so now which chapter this is covered we don't know second coming to the place of supply to determine whether it is an intra goods or interstate goods the issue comes up is that uh, 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 whether there is a movement of goods if there is a movement of goods then where it has been uh, uh, delivering it where it is going if 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 i am having a wallet which is there the server is there in singapore then it becomes an export what if buyer and sellers both wallet is in singapore the servers are in singapore then the movement is between outside two country whether it will be called as a drop shipment and the other thing is that okay if it is not amounting to movement of goods it says that the goods when it was present where it was present when the activity is happened now the all the servers most of this people servers all the exchange even who are there in india are having a aws server or an azure server which is located outside indian territory so now this goods which is there in outside when a transaction is happening within india can it be taxed at all so it is not going to be easy at all from determination of tax from a gst point of view unless until a specific chapter has been brought in a specific classification has been brought in it is going to be an unending litigation as far as taxing cryptocurrency under gst is concerned so that's my view on the uh, uh, cryptocurrency uh, hope that answers uh, your query mr uh, premna ankita varma is asking how cryptocurrency will work in future i don't think so anybody are uh, having any clue here we are all clueless only so we need we also need to wait and watch how the crypto goes uh, so that's uh, uh, there from the chat box anybody has any question uh even if you want to raise hand i think we have a facility where we can make you allow to speak uh, lakshmi madam is that possible if somebody wants to speak if they raise hand uh, we can allow them to speak i think yes sir so you can also raise your hands uh, participants in case you are having a challenge in typing it in the question answer so in the meantime i think i think other thing is yes as you said the government has to come up even from the gst perspective on uh, means to have a complete clarity because earlier days also there had so much issues like dpp certificate when people were trading or you have now carbon credits so, so already there were uh, several issues in past from vat perspective and now uh, i think maybe with the coming investigation by dgci probably that may be one reason where government may want to wait and see what is the outcome of those investigation and then probably formulate the policy Uh, so maybe helping we have to see what is the outcome of those ongoing uh, investigation by dgci so what do have more clarity yeah yeah sir my view is that government uh, rbi is preparing for the law as well as uh, rupee crypto so that will come uh, my view is that it will come before march one more question march. they are they are hurrying up because they have collected lot of suggestions and view point and they are working on that and that uh, i i gather it from the statements of finish minister also it will come sooner than later so i think they are uh, already ready with something probably waiting for some further suggestions or whatever is there then i think things will be clear whether is a regulated uh, legal or not regulated or whether is a currency or whether is a asset or whatever is there so something will come out of that that's what my use sir but uh, uh, very dangerous sir uh, it will lead to lot of lot of black money circulation and illegal circulation that is a that is the problem no that is what they don't legalize no. the crypto i Hello, think anmandu uh, wants sir. to ask a question yeah sir, mr sir about, about this cryptocurrency the government is not considering it as a asset at all it is only that they want to tax on speculated value means the Correct, speculation sir. done on that But it is not on the asset itself. Government is not. No, no, not the asset. asset. As of now, is not asset. That's the part. Not the asset. It is only speculated. But the asset is become legal. Government wants to tax. Yeah. That's the only thing I think I, I understood. Yeah. But one of the things, uh, the other side which we are missing is that uh, there are a lot of people have started accepting the uh, cryptocurrency. No, sir. No, sir. Government has not considered, uh, not accepted cryptocurrency as a currency. No, no. Government no, has no, not no. accepted. Neither currency I, nor asset. Yes. Me as a me as a charter accountant, I can accept cryptocurrency and provide your service. Sir, so if that is that is that is a, that is a, a lot, of, lot of people have come up with it. So what yes. happens when an exchange is happening against a purchase? It is not a speculation. There. <laughs> it, 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 it is absolutely great. It is not a speculation. Yeah, government is not accept not concerned that with the asset itself. That is the only thing they say. 
thank you thank you mr anmandu for your thank you sir babu tomorrow is a capital market committee is there one of the agenda is crypto why don't you join tomorrow i'll tell sure. kkg to call you tomorrow please send me the invite it is very good i'll, yeah, I'll tell kkg to invite you also yeah. i'll join i'll join sir thank you okay. thank you sir thank you mr anmandu thank you uh, i think if uh, no more questions i think uh, we had a uh, uh, we had a very good deliberations i think all the faculties uh, uh, gave their best for the insight of the budget is concerned so over to uh, uh, lakshmi madam for her uh, uh, closing remarks and vote of thanks so sir thank you on behalf of ftcca and fapcca we thank you very much for the speakers of kamalesh garu and uh, amit kumar fitkari wal the direct tax proposals and indirect tax proposals in extensive manner explained and clarified doubts also and i also thankful to the chairmen of the session ramdev butada garu and sudhir garu and our uh, mc member um, uh, kankariya garu to participate in the deliberations and also thankful to the participants for their active participation i thank you one and all I, um, i request the mit kumar fitkariwal to share your presentation so that it will be useful to our members sure i'll mail it okay sir thank you kamlesh garu also i request you to share your presentation sir thank you thanks a lot to everybody thank you also bye thank you everyone thank you ma'am have a good day bye bye